Each year in autumn, hundreds from around the world gather in a small English town. They've come in search of a rare prize, a horse that could one day be champion of the race courses. A vet put it to me, well, one day, the thoroughbred is the Grand Prix car of the horse world. It's a spectacle. You know, once you're involved in it, it is quite addictive. At 900,000, I'm going to sell her up on top, though. And at the world's premier yearling sale, the promise of speed is bought and sold for top dollar. 900,000 way up on top. That's the dream. That's what we're selling. Last call roundabout hammers up. As buyers and sellers pit their finances. 3,500,000, the hammers up. Acumen. Normally, I'm quite accurate on what a horse will make. Any more down below here? And luck against one another. It's very difficult to read when you're selling whether people are still on the horse. No, sir. But it's a gamble. The whole business is a gamble. This is Europe's leading bloodstock auctioneer, Tattersalls. And every October, its Book One yearling sale has the titans of racing beating a path to its door. From Ireland, the world's largest thoroughbred breeding operation, owned by the Magnia family. In the Middle East, Dubai ruler Sheikh Mohammed, founder of Godolphin, 12 times British champion owner. From the Far East, major racing nations Hong Kong and Japan, with powerful owners keen to import the best European bloodlines. And over the last five years, a new wave of large-scale Chinese owners who have made record-breaking purchases. With foreign money accounting for two-thirds of Tattersall's 330 million pound revenue last year, everyone is looking to impress a new class of wealth. As recently as last week, Sheikh Mohammed was a, a client of ours. Some big owners from Japan are also here, and uh, we hope we might have uh, one or two horses that may interest them. The Book One auction is where buyers come to buy the champions of the future. Over the next three days, 127 bidders will buy over 519 lots, each representing one yearling. A yearling is an adolescent horse between one and two years of age that has never raced. A year ago, Tattersall sold the highest priced yearling ever in the world at this sale for a staggering 4.2 million pounds. It's possible history could repeat itself today. Normally I'm quite accurate on what a horse will make. There's one cult here this week, I mean, it could make Three million or five million. Three million two hundred. Three million. Three million four hundred thousand. But I sat him across here. Three million four. The man never misses. But the nine-time champion, seventy-three Group One winners. At three million four hundred. But I sat him across. I'll take the five plus any good sir. At three million four hundred. Come back to a minute here. At three million four hundred thousand. Any more down below here? Last call round about the cracking son of Galilee. Now sir, you have a cracking one. Well, thanks very much. At three million four hundred thousand. Bloodstock agent Charlie Gordon Watson is representing clients from around the world at this sale. He set a simple mission for himself. To buy as many horses as possible for the best possible value. I prefer to spend less to let me get good horses for less money. But working against him are consigners like Ted Vout 
who specializes in selling for others. It's very competitive out there, and you lose the horses if you undersold them. Ted has big hopes for a pair of Kitten's Joy yearlings, sent to him by American owners Ken and Sarah Ramsey, and wants to make sure they're only sold at the right price. Kitten's Joy is the leading sire in America right now. I'd be disappointed if he didn't make 250 to 300,000. As serious money changes hands, one man is feeling the pressure. There's always pressure, but, uh, you know, there's so much of it you can control and there's some you can't control. So at this stage, we sort of let the horses do the talking. Peter Kavanagh breeds each horse he brings to the sales. Today is the culmination of years of investment and hard work. It all happens in a fairly short time, you know. We spend three years getting them to that stage. The horse is going to walk out, it'll either make an impression or not. And if he doesn't, you know, your work is in vain. By the end of the three-day auction, all will be decided under the gavel. In Kildare, Ireland, adjacent to the nation's largest bloodstock breeders, is the 300 acres family-run Kildare Stud. Owned by Peter Kavanagh. six foals and three mares. We're creep feeding them, which means that the foal has access to the food and not the mare, so the mare is afraid to go in under the tape and the foals go in under willingly. And they're eating maybe almost a pound per I'll month of age, so they're eating maybe four to five pounds of feed a day. And uh, that's in two feeds in the morning and in the evening. An average 40 thoroughbred yearlings are born on the farm each year and raising them is round-the-clock work. Hey, fella. Good lad. Good lad. Good lad. Good lad. Oh, missed you. It's not a five-day job. It's a seven-day job, and sometimes it's a 24-hour day. I reckon there's about 25% of breeders make money or show a return, or, you know, and I suppose it tends to be the people who put in the most work, really. Well, Oh, Hi, thanks. how are you? Peter and his wife Antoinette started Kildara Stud 30 years ago from little more than a small plot of farmland. Over the years, they've made a livelihood out of breeding and selling horses. You know, mares that are in foal, not in foal, for before October the 1st, so we need to get the vet down. Thoroughbreds, known for their speed, are the only horses used in racing. Although it's an inexact science, it is believed that current winners give birth to future ones. Peter needs to mate the right stallions or male horses with the right mares or female horses. It's a skill honed by years of experience. Peter has a very good nose. He's, he's, he's uh, exceptional. You know, there's one or two other people up there with him in the business. Did you pay her originally when you came in here? You must have given her a big, yeah. pay, a big I check know, to I make know. all this. No, I have to say that. I have, to, say I have that. to ask her for that in writing. <laughs> yeah. No, it's very good. It is. That's a one-off. Even with the best bloodlines, only one in ten progenies goes on to become a successful racehorse. But Peter believes a few of his colts, or male yearlings, could be potential winners. This is the Lope de Vega colt, going to book one. He's got great strength, great rear end on him, nice balance, good bone. The mare costs about six figures. And then to use Lope de Vega, I think his fee was probably about 25,000. It's a significant amount of money. This is a Sayuni cult out of mad existence. He's one of the big hopes, one of the big dreams, you know, as he's by a very good stallion and he's an exceptional physical as well. He was just born like that. So he'd be hopeful too, he'd be a, a runner. And that's the, that's the dream, the ultimate dream. The cost of raising a yearling is at least 13 to 22,000 pounds. 
and with hefty investments going into securing the best pedigrees, Peter needs to turn a profit at Tattersall's Book One yearling sale in three weeks' time. They will be selling eight of their yearlings at this year's auction. Preparations are in full swing to get the horses ready for their public debut. You gotta make profit on the yearling sales, so that's crucial time and it's probably only one one harvest a year we have. You're okay there, Dylan. Good man, well done. This is just conditioning them, getting them into tip top condition, muscled up, strong, and just using themselves very well. It's basically conditioning. At a public auction, a popular horse can be viewed up to a hundred times a day by prospective buyers. So the horses need to be fit and on their A-game. That's the sort of pace you walk. You walk smartly. You don't walk them too far away from the prospective purchaser. They're looking for balance. They're looking for motion. They're looking for a good deep girt, nice sloping shoulder, strong rear end, good hip. It all takes about seven, eight weeks. You don't just get a horse ready for sale overnight. As the, the old saying is, you don't fatten the pig the day of the market. Also no stranger to the art of the sell is bloodstock consigner Ted Vout. We were second in France uh, with the filly, Savannah, in a listed. Instead of breeding them, Ted specialises in preparing and selling other people's horses. So this is Vout Farm and we prepare 10 yearlings a year to go to the sale. Because I've sold at the sales for 30 years, something called consigning. And uh, it's where you take other people's horses, um, maybe bigger owners, maybe people who uh, don't want um, everybody to know who they are. Um, and it's a bit like an estate agency. We detail them, polish them up, and then we take them to the sales, and we advise on how we think that they'll sell best. Ted is a pioneer in the consignment business in the UK. His clients rank amongst the rich and the royal, including the Middle Easterns. But we've had a lot of new people come in, like the Ramses, like the Prince Faisal, Sheikh Mohammed's friends, under the ownership of uh, Rabbi Bloodstock. They send us a few yearlings every year to, to sell on behalf of the friends. The stars this year are a pair of yearlings bred out of leading American stallion Kitten's Joy, a former American champion turf horse and a winner of 81 stakes races. It's Ted's job to make sure the half-siblings shine at Tattersall's. So this is uh, Kitten's Joy, um, Oak Trees Dancing. Uh, he goes to book one. And he is probably one of the best Kitten's Joys I've had. He's got tremendous quarters. He's got, this is where all the power comes from, here and here. But during the preparation, you can see the muscle, how the muscle sort of starts defining so you've got ridges of actual rip because we're selling something very raw and we want people to, to come and see him and think, oh, that's what he's going to look like in training. But it's his sister who could be the real money spinner of the two. Horses can generate revenue for their owners through racing or breeding. A female yearling or filly with good breeding potential could be worth much more than a colt. This is out of Celestial Woods. With a pedigree of three stakes winners. She's a potential broodmare, potential racehorse. Uh, she's a sprinter, which is what everybody wants. She's the one that could really break out and make anything, you know. But it's a gamble. The whole business is a gamble. Europe's premier yearling sale, the Book One at Tattersall's, is an annual affair in October. For the last half a century and counting, this is where it's being staged. Newmarket, 
about 100 kilometers north of London. With a population of 20,000, this small town has an outsized equestrian history. Craig Onwell Frampton, his title was Keeper of the Running Horses to four monarchs in the early days of, in the, early days of the sport. John Berry is a Newmarket Council member. It's former mayor, racehorse trainer, and quite the history buff. In 1603, King James VI of Scotland became King James I of England. When King James I moved down to London to be king, he still wanted to carry on racing horses, hunting, hawking, coursing. And I think it was brought to his attention that there was a town 65 miles northeast of London, big open ground either side of it where you could gallop for several miles in any direction. And he and his courtiers would come out from London to Newmarket and do various sports, including racing their horses against each other. When King Charles II was restored to the throne, the first race that we have got all the documentary evidence for was what we call the town plate, which is still run to this day. The Queen Mother and Princess Margaret are in the royal party, joining a quarter million racing fans for Britain's famed classic. And what the monarch did, society followed. And they're off, the start of a long... The sport of kings is Britain's second largest spectator sport, generating over three billion pounds for the British economy. The princess keeps a close eye on the leader. For a long time, the derby, which was run either last Wednesday in May or first Wednesday in June, Parliament didn't sit on Derby Day because all the politicians wanted to go to Epsom, which is just south of London, for the Derby. At the heart of this rich racing tradition is the English thoroughbred horse. The thoroughbred is a crossbreed of English and Arabic horses, developed in England in the early days of racing for the precise reason of speed. The thoroughbred's resting pulse would be less than 30 beats a minute. At full pressure, it would be in excess of 250. The Olympic runner can run 100 meters in 10 seconds. The horse can run 200 meters in 10 seconds. <laughs> Eight times the mass, going at twice the speed. And that is through centuries of selective breeding. But we've probably reached a stage where the horse is as good as he can be. A vet put it to me well one day, the thoroughbred is the Grand Prix car of the horse world. Ownership details, parentage details. Meticulous records going back 300 years are kept of each thoroughbred horse born. The value of a young, untested yearling will very much be dictated by the prestige of its pedigree. They're worth that because people are willing to pay it. If two very rich people want to own the best horse in the world, it's va that horse's value could be limitless. And compete they will in October at Europe's leading auction of thoroughbred horses. The Tattersall's Book One sale. Well, this is the Tattersall sales ring. It was built in 1967 to celebrate our bicentenary and we're now 252 years old. Here is where the auctioneer will be, and on the rostrum as well, we will have probably three, four, five other Tattersall staff to keep an eye on who might be bidding. And uh, yeah, you'd be surprised that a lot of people are often hiding from, um, <laughs> from view because they don't want other people to see that they're bidding. Jason Singh is marketing manager at an auction house that offers in the region of 7,000 horses for sale throughout the year. The price, as you can see there, we've got at the end of the price, it says GNS. GNS stands for guineas, and we still sell in guineas. So a guinea represents a pound and one shilling in the old. The vendor would keep the pound, and we would keep the shilling as our commission. So that, that's pretty much how it, it still stands today. October is yearling season, and the Tattersalls team is expecting a big turnout, both in attendance and buying power. We've certainly had the 
highest price yearling in the world in the last five years, and we hope to do it again this year. Three million, three million. People come to an auction house like Tattersall's because of the convenience of having every body in the one place. Whereas if you were to go around and look at 500 horses on, on 100 different farms, that would take a lot longer, obviously. We'd certainly like to think that we're adding, you know, that there's a degree of, of atmosphere and theatre, you know, when the big lots go through. Um, you know, there are certainly people who, who get a big kick out of selling a horse for a lot of money, you know, in a, in a pack sale ring like this, for sure. It is, at the end of the day, you know, an exciting experience taking a horse to auction. Hoping to add a few potential stars to his yard this year is racehorse trainer Charlie Fellows whose training facility sits just five minutes away from Tattersall's. So we are going to head out, going to go see them canter. It's the first lot went out at six o'clock this morning. Pitch black, raining. Second lot pulled out about eight o'clock and now this is the third lot. We're on Warren Hill, uh, which is probably the most famous canter in the world. Uh, as far as training is concerned. The best horses could run up to sort of 40, 45 miles an hour. Um, they wouldn't do that here. They'd save that to the races. As October looms, trainers like Charlie start advising their clients on good yearlings they can add to their racing stock. Tattersall starts next week, so I'm going to be up there a huge amount. I have a few owners that would, that would potentially buy so you're always hopeful that you might come away with some. Uh, it's very much not set in stone. You know, at the end of the day, you are working on behalf of the client and you have to get them what you believe is value for their money. Uh, and if, if the prices are going to be ridiculous, it's irresponsible to go and spend you know, an owner's money when you don't think you're getting the right price. There are a lot of very good horses that cost very little money. Um, and at the end of the day, price tag doesn't mean a lot. It's two weeks to the Book One Yearling Auction, and Irishman Peter Kavanagh is holding his breath. A horse's bone structure is a major consideration for any prospective buyer. Each yearling at the Tattersall's Book One sale must come with a mandatory set of x-rays available for viewing. If there was an issue, it would probably manifest itself by now, but hopefully there is none. That's his passport if you need it. He's lot 36 in the sale. Yeah, let's go. We might have to. He's the best bone of any yearling I've done yet anyway. Good. Hopefully it's all good bone. I'll just have a quick scan through yeah. them here. Okay. Just to have a look. Yeah. yeah so that's pretty... That's pretty good. You'd have to be happy with that. But the vet seems to have found a problem with one of Peter's best horses. You can go down a little bit. You can see it back there. Something you don't like on it. Yeah. The x-ray has picked up an anomaly in the joints. So you can see there's some issues in the you hint on the lateral, and then you have middle carpal joint here. On we took it to see if it looked better or worse in a different view, but it looks the same. I think we're 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 finished there, okay? Oh yeah. yeah. On both or on one? Uh, both. Yeah. Okay. Are they detached? They're not well attached, here, you know, they're yeah. not going to go anywhere, you know. Yeah. Two look 100%. One guy is a slight issue, and it's just a question of interpretation. So, you know, I don't, I don't think it's any serious issue. He's never taken a lame step. Just a developmental little change in the bone structure. So it's probably temporary, and hopefully in three weeks' time it'll look perfect. The 
October Book One sale at Tattersall's is arguably the world's leading auction of thoroughbred yearlings, after producing record prices over the last three years. Four days to the sale. 500 untested year old horses from around Europe and America arrive at Tattersall's for a date with destiny. Peter Kavanagh's yearlings have travelled on a 12 hour journey from Ireland to the UK. His son Roderick is heading the welcome party. The horses just arrived in at about 7 o'clock and hopefully we'll have them settled in. The girls have been travelling with them through the night and the guys got to uh, do a flight, thank God. Last week was quite tough in Ireland sales. We, we weren't hitting the heights that a lot, of, uh, a lot of other places were, but I think we have probably stronger drafts of horses for the next two weeks. This is the best of the best. Just going to let everything out. Okay, so we'll all take a filly and then we'll go with them and then come back for the colts. Anyway, sorry, that was the stress and now we're kind of organized. We just had to get these out. Indeed. Great. This is it. Just mind yourself. This is why we're here, yeah. <laughs> Although Roderick grew up on the family farm, he officially joined the business a few years ago and has come to appreciate the realities of running a commercial farm. I do feel pressure. It's a very public business, so your results are, there's no hiding place, so everybody is aware. Yeah, your, your results of the sales are very public and if it, go, if it goes wrong, you can look silly and you want to just get out of that place as quick as you can. But at the same time, it is a passion and uh, I absolutely love it. For three whole days before the Tattersall's Book One auctions, over a hundred consigners have the chance to show their horses to prospective bidders across Tattersall's 800 stables. There are a lot of consigners here and you've got to stand out slightly and I've always stood out because we do yellow and blue um, and that's what we've always done. We have a coffee machine, which is very useful first thing in the morning. And I bring that from home, yeah. And then you have the M&Ms with the without sails on it, and in yellow and blue. It's not just the sellers who are hard at work preparing for the sale. So I'm just going to look at this one. One of Britain's leading bloodstock agents, Charlie Gordon Watson, has arrived on the grounds determined to inspect the whole offering. I'd probably look at about 140, 150 each day. I always try and think and look at a horse and it should look like its pedigree. Because sprinters and milers and stayers, they all look different. And, and then I try and get a balance of the budget, the confirmation, and the pedigree. A third, a third, a third. The top tier races in most countries is known as Group or Grade 1. And Charlie has bought 58 Group 1 winners in his 30-year career. Although they are increasingly for owners outside the UK. A lot of people from the Far East and the Middle East, much more so than Europeans. We like English people to be buying, but there aren't that many. English people can't really afford it. <laughs> Whereas the Chinese and the Hong Kong and the Mid Middle East and Japan and all those people, they can. But I've always done a lot of business in Hong Kong for about 25 years and I've been going there every year, twice a year. I've been to China a few times. I don't have a big client from China yet, but I would like one. <laughs> Foreign orders can come in as late as the day of the sale itself. So Charlie's team needs to be ready for any last-minute requests. You go and find the horses and look at the horses and you get vets to look at them and there's a lot of hoops to go through and then you go into the ring and you've got to beat everybody else to buy it. So it's a long process. So you have to do all the work and be ready. 
be prepared and then everything hopefully falls into place. It's the day everyone has been waiting for. First is lot number one. He's a cracking yearly consignment from Hillwood Star. Day one of the Book One auction kicks off. And a million one thousand six hundred on top there, and one million one hundred thousand guineas. Any more round about the last four round about the top? Let's start. All that. A million one will done. Sold with a million one. The first big lot of the day for consigner Ted Vout is one of two Kitten's Joy yearlings that he's selling for an American owner. 18 on sale this evening, yes, offers a Kitten's Joy, ladies and gentlemen. Shout me a star, of course. Down the years, wonderful star, ladies and gentlemen. Leading star in the US. But interest doesn't seem to be picking up. We had been vetted a couple of times. Uh, one of them was for a person that normally spends around 100,000, and the other was for the Hong Kong Job Club and something must have happened. He either didn't get the second look list or... And it's very difficult to read when you're selling whether people are still on the horse. The owner said that they would ha were happy to have him at 200,000 and below. So we put a 200,000 reserve on and uh, he's going back to America. Irish breeder Peter Kavanagh is up next. Lot 23 is the chestnut colt of Lope de Vega. 23, 23, Kentaro Star. Yes, home of many, many high class racehorses. They have been down for years now. Thank you, 20, 25, 21, 25, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, 21, Tomorrow we've just got one, the acclimation filly. We're then we five on the last day on Thursday, so I just hope the money doesn't run out, but I'm sure it won't. <laughs> but not everybody at Book One is looking to spend a princely sum. Londoners Mick and Janice have been racing as a hobby for the past 10 years. For Mick, it's a boyhood dream come true. I was born and brought up in Epsom, which is where the derby is run. And it, in, in the days when I was uh, young, it was probably even bigger race than it is now. And um, so that, that sparked my love of horse racing. It's a spectacle. You know, once you're involved in it, it is quite addictive. The whole process of buying a young racehorse, watching it develop, watching it race, hopefully being successful. The couple is hoping there might be a few horses in book one with a more modest price tag. And they've enlisted the help of Andrew Balding, one of the top trainers in the country, to find them. Mick was an accountant as a profession, <laughs> so we quite like keeping the, trying to keep the books straight. <laughs> what you mean is balance the books. Balance the books, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thoroughbred horses generally race until they're four to five years of age before they're retired and sent for breeding. So a performing racehorse could command a good resale price during its three-year-old career. The sort of horse we do, we've always got half an eye on resale. So the horse with a bit of scope is going to go on and give Mick and Janice some, some fun racing and hopefully win some prize money, um, mainly during their three-year-old career, but also have an eye on, on the resale. We've managed to, in the past few years, to resell some good horses to an Asian, to Hong Kong, and uh, and elsewhere. You're always pleased when you are a successful bid. We bought two horses, and if you consider that the the average price at this sale, I think at the moment is running at about 180,000 guineas. 
and our average price for the two we bought was uh, about 55. So you can see we're playing at the right at the bottom end of, of the market here, which is, which is exactly where we want to be. The October yearling sale at Tattersall's is entering its final two days. Three million four hundred thousand. Any more down below here? Day one saw the most expensive yearling sold in the year for three point four million guineas. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. And the Tattersall's team is expecting a second big ticket horse to change hands under the gavel today. Thank you very much indeed. Before going on to the rostrum, auctioneers like Simon Kerrins need to visit each and every lot they're going to sell that day. All auctioneers, we start early enough in the morning. I mean, it takes three to four hours to see the horses in the morning, and especially if you're speaking with the vendors, they tell you who's looked at the horse, who liked the horse, who they think liked the horse, and um, they might give you some updates as to the pedigree as well. I've made my comments in the catalogue as to the positive attributes of the horse and um, I'd have something to say on the rostrum then. 299 is from Longview Stud as a colt by See the Stars out of Chicago Dancer. Out of a sister of course is Skins Game from the family of course of Morayan and Morillian. I suppose your heart always goes fast at um, when you're selling a lot for seven figures. At two million is the bid now, at two million is what I have all the way here now. At two million against you on the stairs, sir. Two million two now, at two million two is the bid now. If you take too big a bid from somebody, as, or an increment, I should say, it can put the other person off. At two million eight, two million eight I have. At two million eight is the bid now, at two million eight. If you three, sir? Anticipating the ring and the market, the um, knowing, knowing what bid to take from a certain purchase or a bidder and to keep them all involved in as long as possible for as long as possible I think that's the greatest skill three million three million three million two is a fresh runner three million two three million two at uh, three million three three million three now three million five hundred thousand beautiful cold isn't he at uh, three million five any more on the gate from at uh, three million five any more across from at uh, three million five any more right-handed last call roundabout hammers up he sells way out on the stairs, this time around then, at 3,500,000, the hammer's up. You're done too, sir, are you? The goal is to get the highest price for your vendor. Um, you want happy customers. That's the ultimate goal. David Redfuss, thank you very much indeed, sir. And the very, very best of luck with him. 3,500,000. I ain't going to sell and make no mistake. As day two kicks off, it's full speed ahead for bloodstock agent Charlie Gordon Watson as the orders pour in. And it appears that his well, preparations are paying off. Up on top. This time, at 700 last call, he is sold. Charlie Gordon Watson, thank you very much indeed. What four horses today? 700, 155, 375, and 225. So it's been a good day. I hope to get two or three more. Lovely daughter, attractive. Quality Scopey Philly by Kittens Joy Roy. After a disappointing first day at the sales, Consigner Ted Vout is also hoping to finish strong on his second Kitten's Joy, the filly out of Mare Celestial Woods. 500, 500, and 500, any more on the vantage, and left-handed hair, 550, 550 now, 600 gone, and 600, the lady left-handed hair, 600, 600 now, and 700, got the pedigree, got the look, got the walk. The owners rang me from America and said uh, we were going to protect her to 400,000, and right at the last minute they said, well, maybe we ought to put it down a little bit, and so we did, we put it down to 350, and uh, we didn't need to, in the end of the day, we, uh, we had some great, great action on her. Hammers up, done, finished and sold left-handed here at 700,000 all done and sold. This time, all done at 700,000 all done and sold at 700. Sean Dugan, thank you very much indeed, madam. She's made 700,000 with Prince Khalid Abdullah was underbidder and a uh, member of the Al Nayan family in Abu Dhabi of, uh, through Sean Dugan of, has bought it. So I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. Yeah. 
And the surprises don't stop there. Lovely attractive filly by the sire of Marsha. Bid me what for her? At 20,000 bid again now, at 20,000 bid all the way you're now. 50,000 bid, 50,000 bid again, 55, 55 now. 80 bid, 80,000 now. 85, 85 now. 105 bid, 200,000 bid. Uh, 200, 200 is what I have. Well, we saw the filly a little unexpectedly. She was popular, but I didn't quite realise she was popular to that level. At 300,000, but again now at 300, 300, at 300, better say 25, sir. It was Alistair Donald for a client of Andrew Balding's, I think, against Roger Varian in the end. At 350,000, get his last call, I sold this time. Hold on. At 350, hold on and sold at 350. Al Donald, 350, thank you, sir. She ended up making 350,000 guineas, so probably doubled my estimation, but. You know, that's why we bring them to public auction. Sometimes this happens, you know. Oh, we'll say goodbye to her, all right. <laughs> we'll give her a nice feed and plenty of water before she travels, so she'll be well looked after. Day three. And Peter's luck in the ring continues. Uh, beautifully looking horse he is, beautifully turned out by Kildara. The Sayuni cult, out of mad existence, didn't disappoint. 150, 150 now, 160, 160 bit, 200 now, at 200,000 bit again now at 200, 220, 220 now, 232, 30 bit. At 300,000, getting all the sold at 300. Ross Doyle, 300 buys, thank you very much indeed. Bringing the end of the book one sale for Kildara Stud to a roaring success. Yeah, it was spectacular actually. Uh, they all sold for in excess of our expectations. They turned out very well. It was like something just coming to fruition. At 250,000, but I'm going to sell and I sell right handed now. At 250,000, all done. Last call and done up on top. I sell a right handed at 250,000 last time. Charlie Gordon Watson, thank you very much indeed. It's a big team effort. It's over a long period of time and it's tiring and they're long days, but. When it all comes together, it's very rewarding. On the other side of the ring, Londoners Mick and Janice have had less success. I have to take a breather. It's been quite a long day so far, and sadly, no joy. We've been uh, sort of close to a couple of horses, but no, no purchase today yet. So, after a quick team meeting, they've decided to call it a day and celebrate the small victories. Let me show you the two that we've got. That one and that one in their new home. The dream would be to win the derby, but, but realistically, um, the probability of us doing that would be, would be very small. Um, we had a small victory two years ago. Uh, we won the first race on derby day at Epsom, and that was a fantastic feeling uh, for me. And that's really it. It's, it's, um, it's being part of something that is developing and progressing, and you hope to, um, you know, to watch your the horse that you have bought develop and progress and win races and and bring enjoyment to us. At 375, the hammer's up and I sell right, you know. At 375, quite sure down below then. At 375, last time. Charlie Gordon Watson. For agent Charlie Gordon Watson. The high octane drama of the sales ring is all in a day's work. So, how much money did you spend in total? Four, five million. I haven't added it up. It's been very good. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. And we've hopefully bought some really nice horses. What, 12 in the end. It was very hard. Very hard. Very expensive. <laughs> Mainly for my main client, Mr. Suhail, a few English people, and, some, and the. Um, Al Shukab Racing from Qatar. Mr. Johnny Lung from Hong Kong bought a horse for 300,000 at Kingman Colt. Big, strong horse. It's exciting, but and a responsibility because they then got to do well racing. In a few minutes, the book one sale will draw to an end. Trainer Charlie Fellows is looking for a late victory after not having bought anything over the last two days. We had a slow start, first two days were very quiet, but then things just fell into place today. We were bidding against another trainer, William Haggis, who I know very well, so I was sort of giving him death stare across the ring, telling him to stop and leave me alone. Yeah, yeah, he was laughing, he was laughing. At 200,000, last time. Well done, and the very, very best of luck with him, sir. 
he was expensive enough, yeah, 200 grand, but he was a lovely horse, a uh, beautiful mover, bypass net rock with a good pedigree and very well bought by Gary. So I am very much looking forward to training him. Yeah. We've come away with four today, which is really good. Um, let any, anything from book one, you know you've got a good chance. There's always pressure on it. doesn't matter whether it's a five grand horse or a 250 grand horse. At the end of the day, it's got an owner who wants results um, and you know wants to see it do well. And uh, my job is to try and do that. With 14 lots over the million guinea mark and a chart-topping price of 3.5 million guineas for the most expensive yearling sold, the curtains finally come down on the October Book One auction. 105 million, 106 million over the three days. So great days, great weeks. Just finalising a few little bits and pieces, press releases, and uh, um, yeah, making sure the website's up to date, and then uh, in to have some dinner and a glass of wine. As the dust of the hectic sales week settles, the work for next year's auction begins. I suppose that's one of the fascinations of it and the great rewards of breeding is that you're just, you're creating something new. There's a new crop every year, so you get to shape it to some degree. On a nice fine day and everything is good on the farm, like there's nowhere you'd prefer to be other than here, you know. It is always a wake up call when you go back over and look it over through an old catalogue. 10, 15 years ago, and you see the names on top of the pages, you know. A lot of them go and come, you know. They say one generation makes it, another spends it, you know. So hopefully we'll hold on to it for as long as we need it anyway. I suppose when my dad set out, he was kind of like one of the first of a generation to start doing what he did. At the time, horses was for the wealthy people, but there was no money to be made out of it. it was for wealthy people to breed horses to go racing. Whereas he saw this opportunity where you could bring him to the sales and you could shine a pebble and bring it back and its value would increase. And in terms of my goals, I suppose it's maintaining where we are and building on that if we can and, and, and yeah, improving the brand if we could.